So I think one of the misconceptions could be that, you know, digitizing everything is better. In theory, yes. In practice, it doesn't always manifest itself as, as a solution, right? Because then you've digitized everything, with thus making the process more effective, but you also inadvertently left people out. Welcome to Bridging the Digital Divide, a smart city podcast from SUFA, where we explore the places where urban landscapes are intertwined with technology to see how connectivity thrives, innovation sparks, and sustainability grows. Welcome to Bridging the Digital Divide, a smart city podcast from SUFA. I'm Kyle Hawk. I lead the marketing team here at SUFA, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Allie Peters. Allie, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing good. Um, feeling really good after this conversation that we just had uh, with Albi Bocanegra, um, who you had reached out to to join our show. He's the founder and CFO of the Urban Futurist, which is a consultancy and advisory organization. Um, he's had a really unique b- background working with both big brands and cities. He was previously the CTO in, in New York City. Um, one of the most fascinating guests that we've had so far simply because of how diverse his background is and all the different uh, places he's been, people he's worked with that all kind of like tie in in unexpected ways to moving cities into the future. So I, what were kind of your, what, you know, what stuck out to you uh, when you were first reaching out to Albi to join the show? Yeah. Um, well, honestly, like you said, his background was very uh, interesting, especially just looking at his LinkedIn too. He's had, he has so many different experiences listed on his LinkedIn and he's always posting, um, about the cool experiences that he's having. And I thought, wow, this, this, this person seems to be doing a lot of great work and it'd be cool to, uh, hear about all of Albie's past experiences and, um, how he's taking those experiences, um, and putting it into the work that he's doing at the urban futurist. Yeah, so I think you're really going to love this conversation with Albi. And again, it's so interesting having spoken with so many folks now working in local city governments, moving smart city initiatives forward, and now getting to talk with Albi and getting the perspective from so many different angles of different groups that are involved with these types of projects was really great. Hope you enjoy it. Here's Albi Bocanegra. So considering that you worked um, in a few different fields or in a few different contexts with cities, what initially drew you to working with the city of New York or with city technology in general? You know, I've always been super, I've been a curious person my whole life. Usually that got me in trouble. Um, (laughs) Over the years, it's actually gotten me opportunities. But, you know, I always, uh, I was really working in, uh, in the human capital world, like think, you know, driving like executive searches and like really um, making organizations more diverse, et cetera. And then I saw the, the, huge need for tech talent in government. Mm -hmm. I saw that there was like huge struggles with capacity, um, in cities, in governments. I was, I was working at the University of Southern California and I was on, on one of the task force for, for, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles. Um, and mostly it was about hiring veterans and helping, you know, um, underserved populations, et cetera, get access to employment. And it always came back to technology. Like, how can we use technology to help people? How can we help people find tech jobs? How can we upskill our residents or veterans to find higher paying? And usually the higher paying jobs were in technology. So it, I, it, I didn't go search for civic tech. Like it found me really like, I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but it really did find me. It kept coming up. And so I had the opportunity to go work for the city of San Francisco, um, on a program that I built called the tech talent program, where San Francisco was struggling with capacity issues and, you know, bringing in some innovation into their hiring practices, which as you know, cities, Hiring practices are very outdated and cumbersome and long. And so the idea was like, how can we pilot a program that shows that we can hire with agility and recruit the best and brightest without offering them all the salaries and perks and all the beautiful things that they get with tech companies? So I kind of cracked that nut, happy to say, and we hired a bunch of technology workers, uh, helped a bunch of agencies deploy a bunch of projects that were stalled because they didn't have the staff like you know just and and more and i just became like immersed like that was my world you know obviously living in in the bay area working in san francisco 
you know, I was finding myself always at tech boot camps and, and training places and people were like tech people convene. I mean, the office next door to us was like Uber, uh, mm. Twitter was across this, uh, down the way too. Like it was just like inevitable. Like tech was just in my face. I had no, let's just say I didn't have a say about it. <laughs> it was like, Hey guy, you're in tech. You're going to be in tech. The yeah. end. end of story signed life, you know? <laughs> well, obviously, you know, as Ali mentioned, your background has touched so many different parts of working with cities and technology leading into what you do today. You're the founder and the CFO of the Urban Futurist, which is a consultancy and uh, advisory organization. Talk to us a little bit about what sparked the beginnings of that. What led you to take this on as your next endeavor? Yeah, you know, like I mentioned, I I had a really unique opportunity to support cities you know, for almost four years. And that was thrilling and it was exciting and I loved doing it. My challenge was once we did co-identify the problem, like, you know, part of my job wasn't just like city X comes to me saying, Hey, I'll be, we really need help with our mobility or we need help with our smart lighting, you know, whatever. And then I would just show up with this, like a bunch of solutions and a bunch of things to throw at them and sell them, et cetera. You know, um, it was always about co-identifying the real problem. Cause sometimes you just got to get a little in the weeds and, you know, kind of reverse engineer what the real underlying issue is, and then kind of go forward from there and then really identify the problem statement. And then, then test pilot, you know, figure out what the proper solution is and come to the conclusion that this is the path forward. My challenge was I could only get to that. That was the end of my engagement, right? Once we figured out, hey, here's the path forward. Here's the here, number one. Here's the problem. Uh, number two, here's a set of solutions that could work. It's time to test. It's time to pilot. It's time to experiment. Is That's kind of where I hopped off, you know, where I got off the train. Um, so I didn't get to like go all the way forward with them and, and see it all to the very end. The other challenge I think I was having was that um, there also got came a point where if there wasn't a role to play or, a, or, or a, a solution that involved my employer, then that was also where I was like, okay, well, now I'm handing this to you new newly formed group to go go on and prosper right so there was always like an end point for me it was like my engagement was sure i could still kind of shepherd it and foster it and you know kind of but i didn't get to like really take it to the finish line and so um and then i was also limited even though i did get a lot of space to get involved in a bunch of different types of projects is you know, there was a lot of things I had to like pass on because like, well, you know, there's not really a role. Like I also can't justify giving time, effort and resources into something that ultimately isn't going to come back and and support the business case for it, for me spending my time on it. Um, and so, again, I we did a lot of great work and a lot of good stuff, but I think I was still a little, you know, constrained on what I could get involved with and how much I could do. So I figured, you know, the next job for me is going to be something where I get to pick my project based on the need and not, not, not if it aligns with the business or not. Mm -hmm. It's also going to be, give me the opportunity to go as far as I want with it. And I can pick the best partner for it. Just unencumbered, right? So I thought, well, how would I like? You know, I kind of just was like agonizing over it. It's like, well, then do I go work for a philanthropy? Do I go, you know, work for like this uh, an academic institution? But then I'm like, well, I don't want to do just research. I want to, I want to do cool stuff. Um, so then I just came to the conclusion, and it was to my wife's like dismay, right? I'm like, uh, I think I want to launch my own business, my own company, um, and I want to consult and I want to help. I want to just be able to touch everything, all things future of cities. I want to touch it. If it's tourism, I want to touch it. If it's smart, you know, IOT and smart devices, I want to touch it. If it's healthcare, I want to be involved. If it's like, you know, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing, I want to touch it. Like I want all of it. Like, I don't want to just be like the, this guy does these three things. 
Talk to him mm. about payments and finance. Talk to him about this or that. That's not who I want to be. I want to be like the person that does picks the best projects because cities need it and people need it, not because it aligns with my business outcomes, right? So, so I just had to make that decision. And, you know, it was a super, super scary one. Freaked my wife out, <laughs> you know, that I was going to. But I'll tell you what, uh, uh, the Urban Futurist is going to be a year old on November I don't know. Let's just call it December 1st, whatever. But I'm, I'm, it's about to be a year old. And I'll tell you, I haven't, not only do I have more work than I've ever had in my whole entire life, and I've been on a plane more than I ever have, and I've been in front of cities and decision makers more than I ever have in my entire life, I have complete control of what I get to do and the partners that I get to pick for it and how, and, and, I'm proud to say that all of the same people that I had been supporting over the years from 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 not even San Francisco, from USC all the way to until last year when I launched this, they've all come to me for some kind of support. So on the first day of launching the Urban Futurist, I was already employed. I already had partners. I already had work. Um, I, I got called on by the Charter Cities Institute to help them with the development of new cities across the African continent. Um, then I had shortly after had Smart Cities Council calling me to be their futurist in residence. Um, you know, and, and then I had a couple of uh, startups that asked me to be on their board and take an equity position in their companies. Like these are all things I could have never done while having a traditional job, like the job I had, right, which was like, you know, had to focus on what they wanted me to focus on. I had, there was, I could, things could potentially be conflicts of interest if I took equity positions and companies, et cetera. And now like I can do anything I want as long as I do it well, right? As long as I do right by my partners. The only KPI there is I deliver on the thing, on the promises I make to the people that I work for my clients. Um, so yeah, so I went from having one boss to <laughs> having like five bosses. So <laughs> You know, and I, and they're all amazing. And the cool thing about it is everyone in my sphere that I advise or whatever, it's all people that I always think should be working together. So I end up partnering my partners with each other. Um, so it's, been, it's super cool where, how I get to like interweave all the people I work with into like, it's, it's the dream. Like, it's also, you know, it's tough. I won't say it's easy. You know, because you're not on payroll or whatever, you got to bill people and you got to remind people like, hey, I do this for money because people are used to me giving out free advice. Mm. <laughs> so, so that's it, man. That's And that's how that's how I I launched the Urban Futurist. I couldn't be happier. Um, I could not be more lucky and more employed than I than ever. And here we are. And I, I mean, I, I run we run a family business, our factory. So I get to do that, too. Like I literally get to do whatever I want. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you've not only expanded your network, but I'm sure you're also learning so much more about all these different kinds of technologies and innovations going on by getting to kind of pick and choose and like just kind of see everything uh, right in front of you. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm definitely curious, um, do you have any notable projects um, from cities or uh, uh, companies that you've advised that have put out some really cool stuff? Yeah, there's a few things. So look, I had the benefit of meeting with uh, the CEO and the um, chief sustainability officer from Tonymous, who are really, they're building the technology infrastructure for Neom in Saudi and to book. So, but I had the opportunity to sit with the folks with Joseph Bradley from Tonymous, who's the CEO um, and the chief sustainability officer and kind of understand, like really look at what they're trying to build. And I was just blown away. Like from, from that side, their focus is really kind of making Neon like a cognitive city, right? To go beyond a smart and connected city to going to a city that's cognitive and can predict need and really know their residents sometimes even better than they know themselves through the use of technology and, um, informatics and data, et cetera. And really kind of the way I look at Neom is that it's going to be like a living, breathing organism, a community, a true ecosystem that really understands the needs of their residents before the need even happens. Right. And so they're, they're making huge investments in creating, when you think of Neom as a concept, right, you're like, 
it is one of the most un- unforgiving landscapes in the world, right? The middle of the desert where there's extreme heat and there's just like everything, all the odds are against you, right? And somehow they had the vision to say, this would be the ideal place to create a city. And mm-hmm. here's how we're going to do it. And not only are we just going to build a city, we're going to make it one of the best places for people to live and to dedicate ourselves to the improvement of the human condition for the people that live there. And so, you know, getting to have a front row seat and kind of listen to the plans, that's an exciting project. I'm going to be watching them very closely and probably finding ways to get myself involved in that work. Then like on a, on a, on a smaller scale, but incredibly significant, I think is uh, I'm advising a company called Ecosystems Informatics Inc. ESI. um, And they've kind of pioneered this new technology uh, based around air quality. Um, Mm. So like I said, I get to pick now. I don't have to say, well, I'm not a sustainability guy or I'm not a a public health guy. Why should I care about air quality? Um, Now I get to say I'm an everything guy. So I do care about air quality because air quality helps people under cities that understand their air quality and the data behind it and get to do something with it, get to decide how they better plan their cities, how to reduce carbon footprint and where to make infrastructure investments. And all of that leads to better public health. And so ESI has created, you know, these devices that are tiny compared to what you usually for air quality, it's usually like towers, you know, there it's more furniture, more junk that eventually has to be recycled or dealt with or whatever. So they have these tiny devices that can go on any municipal fleet that, so that's uh, trash trucks, buses, police vehicles, et cetera. They can mount this tiny sensor and it will detect down to like the billionth particle of what's in the air and give cities real time information. So cities can say, we have a really high concentration of CO2 or, hey, over by the factory, there's a lot of metal in the air that's dangerous, et cetera. So they can they can in real time understand what, how the decisions they make, infra- infrastructure or policy can affect the environment and the air that people breathe. Like what is more important than the air that human beings breathe, right? Um, and so that work is super exciting. And, and there's just a lot of cities right now that are – I saw an article, and this is like, by the way, this is not a criticism. I saw an article on Bloomberg a couple of months back saying, well, these are the five ways that cities need to start thinking if they want to be better about blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't agree with that. I think cities have been thinking like that. Mm. I think cities have been more experimental and innovative and all that. And so there's a lot of cities right now. So not even to call it just a specific project, but there's a lot of cities that are working super hard to crack the nut on like procurement. Uh, they're starting to, to really kind of explore and experiment with like autonomous vehicles and autonomous shuttles to help their communities in need be able to get around and get to work, get to their appointments, get childcare, all of that stuff. And so I see the I, let's just say the project I'm most excited about is it's we are all now moving or are in an era where technology is more human centered and it's about serving people. Uh, and these are some of the specific projects, ESI's work and, and the stuff happening in Neon. Smart Cities Council is, you know, ramping up their task forces. Um, Charter Cities Institute is really helping build these new cities in Africa to help with alleviate poverty and help um, uh, economic, you know, help help in, in unlock economic progress for small businesses and people in across Africa. Like, Man, it's a great time to be alive. I'm just excited. Well, you actually, uh, in mentioning that Bloomberg article, it's a really great transition to the next question I was going to ask because, you know, here on this show, we've talked with cities of, you know, big cities, small cities, cities that are well, you know, years into big projects and revitalizing and revolutionizing what it means to think about technology in a smart city context and some that are just in the early stages. And I'm wondering from your perspective, as you know, you talk with cities of all shapes and sizes, different areas of the world, what are some of the common misconceptions that you hear about smart city technology and the way cities are thinking about the the future? Well, I think one thing that we have to Maybe it's not a misconception, but maybe it's just a, an oversight is that we we still tend to assume connectivity and access. We still think everyone's connected sometimes, right? We still assume people are connected and we assume people have devices to connect. So yep. I think one of the misconceptions could be that, you know, digitizing everything is better. Mm. In theory, yes. 
in practice, it doesn't always manifest itself as as a solution, right? Because then you've digitized everything, with thus making it making the process more effective. But you also inadvertently left people out because not everyone has access, not everyone's connected, not everyone speaks the language. Uh, people have uh, uh, disability challenges with either their eyesight or hearing, or you know. So there's there's a, a bunch of that, right? And so I think one of the misconceptions is that everyone, if you digitize, everyone will. If you digitize, they will come. And so I yeah. think it's important to really. I, I think that was a conversation we had in Agile Techs in Dubai. Was yeah, it was about digitizing government services. And I just want. I just kind of took a step, asked the panelists to take a step back and say, okay, I'm so glad to hear that Egypt and Dubai and London and all are digitizing services. But what are we doing about ensuring that everyone can access that? Um, so I think that the other misconception, right, is that AI is going to take everyone's job. Mm. I think, you know, we're, everyone's talking about AI. I get it. You know, it's the buzzword. It's the cool thing. It's not new. It's just really shown up this year. Um, and I think that, you know, it's it's our job as technologists, as futurists, as people who care about the future, doesn't matter what your job is, is to make sure that we educate people and, you know, help help kind of shape the narrative around the benefits and the things that AI can unlock for people. Obviously, like anything, like when when we started talking about big data and the, the massive, massive production and use of data, um, there was it always came with some with a disclaimer of some sort, right? It's like privacy is important, safety, security, all those things. So I think the conversation should steer more around here is how you use AI. Here's how you properly can use AI. And here is how you can thrive and prosper by making AI your tool, your part of your toolkit and your toolbox. And so I think, you know, the whole scare tactics that other that people may kind of put out, use to to tell people that AI is going to take their job and it's going to ruin their lives. And, you know, <laughs> the robots are going to take over the world. I think, you know, now you've got cities that are thinking that are predicting maintenance on their fleets, thus saving taxpayers a lot of money. Um, you know, there there's some AI embedded into like GRC, into like risk and compliance tools that can really help cities make better decisions. Um, so I think, you know, we should really look at AI for what it is. It's a tool. Um, and like any tool, it's it's how you use it. And it's if you learn how to use it and do it well. And so, you know, but it also kind of goes back to my first point where we shouldn't assume people just know how to access it and get and that have a device that can access it and all that. So it's like, yeah, AI's here. Let's make sure you all know how to use it. But by the way, let's make sure everyone can just even touch it in the first place. Like, do you have a computer? Do you have connectivity? You know, it all comes back to that. Um, other misconceptions. Well, um, the other misconception maybe for me is when I talk, of, I'm, I talk a lot about the 24-hour city. Um, and a lot of people think I'm talking about partying 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, and I don't think that I think, you know, it's, it's cities running efficiently through a 24 hour period. So you don't put as much stress on a city from nine to five and you don't have all the, the public out all at the same time, but also that shift workers and people that work, uh, remotely on other time zones, et cetera, can still get the benefits of their city. Right. Uh, that people can still get on a bus and get on a train uh, and get their bacon, egg and cheese if they want one at 4 a.m. Uh, or, you know, go go look at a museum or look at beautiful public art or take a walk in the park because the lights are on or the sensors are on and they can detect that you're coming by. All of those things, like, I think that's a huge misconception. When a tech person like me talks about a 24-hour city, uh, people freak out because they're like, why are you, why do you care about this? Like, you don't, you know. Are you like mm. a party guy? Are you a club owner? Are you a festival <laughs> producer? And I'm like, no, uh, I'm kind of person that has seen what kind of stress we put our cities under and the wear and tear that that does to public infrastructure. And if we spread those spread the population across, think about during COVID, um, if we were operating cities 24 hours a day, it wouldn't be about curfews or closing the doors to businesses, it could be like, look, if your social security number ends on an odd number, you can go to your restaurant on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if it's an even number, you can go Wednesday, mm. Friday, and, you know, like spreading out the benefits because the city is available all time. But no, you know, restaurants and bars took a major hit and any kind of place that operated at night took a huge hit 
a lot of businesses closed down. We didn't have to get that. If if we had properly run a 24-hour city, we could have just said not everyone could be out at the same time. Right. Not everyone could be out nine to five. Maybe we shift everyone and spread everyone out. And then we, we probably wouldn't have seen such a huge hit to the economy. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about um, cities digitizing uh, their resources. And that's been a reoccurring theme on this podcast is just how cities can make their technology uh, equitable and accessible to everybody. So in the cities that you've worked with or uh, the city projects that you've seen, um, how can cities make the most of their technology, even if they don't have um, a lot of money or a lot of resources? I think there that there's a lot of ways that cities can still deliver great services in a digital manner with just the staff and the resources that they have, right? I think first they have to decide, first they have to evaluate um, where the where the biggest needs are and where they could make the most impact with with the least amount of resources, right? Um, so if you have a small digital team or a couple of developers or even people that work in your city that have that skill set that may be working in another agency and want to volunteer, you know, if you take create these little small task forces and projects, I there's a lot of people that really care about being a, a public servant. And they'll raise their hand when they can get on like small projects and and get, you know, get off of like their the mundane tasks they're doing every day and be able to contribute to a project that includes what to digitize and how to digitize. Then the second thing is cities, everybody wants to work with cities. Mm. There are so many startups and tech companies that are just dying to, to work with cities and all they want is an opportunity to have test to pilot something, right? Uh, most of those companies could would even want to do it at their expense or maybe even tapping into a philanthropy that wants to give to cities and then provide capacity. But cities have to make themselves easy to work with. Uh, and I know that's not always a challenge when it comes to partnerships, signing MOUs, <laughs> procuring things. And so I think, you know, cities also have to understand that they're not always the, the easiest organizations to do business with. And so how do we unlock that? You know, how do we leverage our economic development office or how do we leverage our innovation shop? And if we don't have one, just how do we leverage a relationship with industry so we can kind of achieve this this journey to digitizing things? You know, there's a ton of nonprofits, a ton of community based organizations that are already providing like free digital education and tools for people. So partner with them, find them, partner with them, bring them in and have them help you. You know, there's. I think right the the excuse to not do things because you don't have a budget th those days are done mm. because there's a lot of support and there's a lot of organizations that will do this for very little to no cost and they'll just do it because it's the right thing to do some of them just want to test their tech mm. um but again there's not a lot of vehicles for cities to bring in like small scale startups to help them solve a problem but i'll tell you what most of the solutions are there like there's there's not a lot of new ideas out there. A lot of people are just perfecting the, the good ideas that already existed. Well, as we wrap up the conversation today, you know, you, you mentioned your world traveler. You were recently in Barcelona for the uh, Smart City uh, World Congress. Uh, you've been you've seen a lot this year. And I'm interested if there's any sort of emergence, emerging technologies in 2023 that people should be paying more attention to or things that you've noticed that you're like, oh, that's in a couple of years, everybody's going to be talking about this. You know, I, I wouldn't, I don't, not to call, I'm probably not just calling out a, a particular technology, but what I am seeing a lot is more and more cities and people are moving forward towards, towards the sustainability path. I think people are starting to really like, there was a lot of people like, you know, screaming from the top of the, from the mountaintop that sustainability is important and making even the solutions and the things we do at a city more sustainable and really kind of going through that path. And now like I'm going to these, you know, I went like to Jitex. I went, yeah, like you said, Barcelona. Uh, I, I went to Smart Cities Investment Summit in Africa and in, in Rwanda, Kigali. Um, well, that was in September. Yeah. And then I just went back. I just got back from Kigali like Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um and a lot more people are talking about electrifying um, their the uh, f their fleets. They're talking about better governing and managing like ESG um, uh, initiatives, uh, more more sustainable technologies, uh, waste reduction, um, 
technologies to better manage water usage. I mean, there's a lot of it. Like, like it's just a huge portion of conferences now where before you'd go to a conference, like all the mobility solutions were there, like in you know, they'd own half the conference. The other ones were like the software platforms like Oracle and Microsoft and, you know, all of the usual suspects. And then the device people, right? The IoT device people and the wireless device people were all like, but then, and then the sustainability people were like over there in like this little corner, you know, to, to having some solutions and devices, not a lot of, not a big state. They didn't really get the shot at main stage, et cetera. And now I'm seeing them kind of more front and center. So I think... Uh, we're moving to towards a more sustainable future by same way that we've unlocked a bunch of things like transit mobility, et cetera. And now they're saying, okay, like, let's use technology to unlock a more sustainable future. I think folks are really paying more attention to that. I appreciate it, uh, especially like now I'm advising an air quality company, right? So all of those things are important. Um, so that's kind of what I'm seeing is a lot more focus on sustainability and, and uh, you know, and all the things that come with it, you know, where the electrifying vehicles, charging stations, you you know, reutilizing urban infrastructure to to be more sustainable. All those things are like front and center. Yeah. Well, sustainability is uh, very close and dear to our hearts. And I think that's a great, uh, great ending point for this conversation. And, you know, I'll be, we, we're so grateful for your time and your insights today. It's been fantastic to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the, the the cities and groups that you're working with as um, some really amazing work is being done. So thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you again to Albie for joining the show. Um, Ali, again, I, I thought that conversation was, was so interesting. He had so many really cool perspectives to share from not only the work that he's done from multiple different angles from a smart city perspective, but his travels around the world and different cities and different parts of the world that um, we just haven't really had as a part of this podcast so yeah. far. But uh, the perspectives he was bringing that so many people, the challenges that so many different folks are facing around the globe was really, really interesting. And it was, I, I know I use this word a lot for our conversations, but it was inspiring, I felt like. Yeah, absolutely. I know it was interesting too to hear how, I mean, he was talking about Dubai and some of the technology that is uh, being developed there. And it just seems so advanced and so high tech. And, um, and like we said to, we're, we're talking to different cities of all different sizes and people from all different backgrounds, but it's cool to hear um, what cities are doing, especially outside the U.S. Yeah, no kidding. And obviously, he mentioned multiple times the move towards sustainability, uh, which, again, we're, we're excited to delve further into on this podcast. We've sort of um, talked about it here and there, but... Um, the, the conversation with Albie that was kind of hinting at this is where everything is heading. And then in our next conversation that we'll have on the show, we're going to get into that even further. So that was really um, exciting to discuss as well. So thank you for listening today and uh, joining us on Bridging the Digital Divide. Ali, as always, great having you along for the ride. Yeah, of course. Happy to keep it going. All right. That's going to do it for today. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to Bridging the Digital Divide. If you enjoyed today's show, make sure to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And then come visit us at sufadigital.com to see how we're pursuing a mission to make every city smart, social, and sustainable.